Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you are watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. Twice per month, I host this show where we discuss common pediatric health topics with top experts from Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we are discussing antibiotics and how the inappropriate use of them is leading to antibiotic resistance worldwide. According to the CDC, at least 30% of antibiotics prescribed in the United States are unnecessary. Today, we are going to dive deeper into understanding antibiotic resistance and why you should care about this topic too. To help us understand this better, Dr. Nipuni Rajapaksi, an expert in pediatric infectious disease, will be joining us. Dr. Rajapaksi is a medical director of pediatric antimicrobial stewardship at the Mayo Clinic Children's Center. She's passionate about judicious antibiotic use and teaching others about antibiotic stewardship. We are excited to have her here with us today. Please join the conversation by sending in your questions and comments under the Facebook Live video stream, and we'll, we'll try our best to get to them during the live broadcast. And thank you everyone who's already sent in questions. Dr. Dr. Rajapaksi, thank you so much for joining us here today. Great, thank you. I'm really excited yeah. to be here to chat about this topic. Yeah, I think I'm gonna learn something. Um, and so how did you get interested in bugs and antibiotics? Yeah. Tell us about your journey. Great, so um, it's always been something I've been uh, interested in. I was kind of drawn to it by the sheer variety of different patients that we get to see in infectious mm -hmm. diseases. There are so many different types of infections out there that affect people of all ages. And so that was really one of the things that I found to be very interesting. Um, it's also quite a broad topic. So we learn everything from the microbiome biology, looking mm -hmm. under the microscope, seeing the bugs themselves, all the way up to um, how to control outbreaks of infectious diseases that can even happen on a global scale. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the main things that drew me to it. The other thing that I was uh, really interested in and really enjoyed about the field was that most infections in kids have been treatable, most are curable, mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the things that I'm here to talk about today is that um, we're starting to have a lot more difficulty treating some of these infections because of the problem of antibiotic resistance. Absolutely. So a common misconception people have is what is the difference between antibiotics and antimicrobials? Um, can you clear that up for us? Yeah, so yeah. that's a great question that we get a lot from our patients as well. Um, we use the term antibiotic to refer to drugs or medications that um, work against bacteria or can kill bacteria. Mm -hmm. The term antimicrobial is a bit more of a broader term that we use for medications that work against uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, parasites, and even uh, fungal infections. Okay, so in your le leadership role, it's you are the medical director of pediatric antimicrobial. So that means that you are directing everything, right? Right. Viruses, bacteria, all those things you're talking about. Exactly. Okay. So um, even though today we'll probably focus a bit more on bacterial resistance, mm -hmm. this is a process that we're seeing happen in viruses mm -hmm. and in um, different types of um, yeast and fungi as well. So it's a kind of a broad, broad area that we're trying to deal with. Okay. So back to antibiotics then. Mm -hmm. How do antibiotics work? Help us understand this. Sure. So antibiotics are amongst the most prescribed uh, medications Absolutely. in medicine. So we use them very commonly. Um, there are lots of different different types of antibiotics as well. We have lots mm -hmm. of different families that uh, can treat different types of infections and different types of bacteria. Um, and so kind of generally speaking, they work in a few different ways. Um, one way is that they uh, prevent the bacteria from being able to build a cell wall, which is part of their structure. They can't live without that, and so the bacteria die. Mm -hmm. um, other types of antibiotics um, can work on different parts of the bacterial cell so that they can't produce the proteins and things that they need to survive. Um, but as I said, there's a lot of different ones and they all kind of work in different ways and against different types of bacteria. Absolutely. And there's, there's, since I trained, you know, many years ago still, I feel like there's been so many new ones that have actually come out and I'm still learning about how they work. Um, and, and the names of them actually. Yeah. So yeah. it can be a confusing yeah. area because yeah. a lot of them have uh, very similar mm -hmm. sounding names, um, even though they might not be related. The first antibiotic was penicillin mm -hmm. that was discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. And since then, we've been lucky to have new antibiotics mm -hmm. developed. But um, as infectious disease specialists, one of our big concerns is that really in the last few years, the new development of antibiotics has slowed down. And so we're having to try and preserve the ones that we have access to currently um, to make sure that they're effective for the patients that we need to take care of. Okay, so making sure that you're prescribing antibiotics for the right illnesses is going to be really important. Um, how, do you, how do you know if an illness is more likely to be viral and not effective with antibiotics or one that maybe needs an antibiotic? Sure, that's a, a great question, and it can be kind of uh, difficult to um, sort out. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of different illnesses that are caused by bacteria. There are illnesses that are caused by viruses. Yes. There are certain symptoms that can be caused by both. Mm 
Um, some things we know are kind of always caused by bacteria. So if you think about something like a urinary tract infection, mm -hmm. that's always a bacterial process. Mm -hmm. um, if someone truly has a urinary tract infection, then antibiotics will help them to feel better. Mm -hmm. um, other things like uh, colds, uh, the flu, um, acute bronchitis mm -hmm. um, or acute coughs, um, those are viral processes. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately taking an antibiotic not only won't help you feel better, but it could also lead to side effects and harm. Mm -hmm. um, other things um, like uh, stomach flus or gastroenteritis mm -hmm. um, can be caused by both bacteria and viruses. Um, and so it can Usually from the story, a doctor can try and help to figure mm -hmm. out which might be causing the problem. But thankfully, most of those things get better on their own without antibiotics as well. A question I hear in the office a lot mm -hmm. is, um, my child's snot is green, and does that mean it's a sinus infection? Do we need antibiotics? Is that true, or is that a myth? Yeah, so this is a very common misconception. Um, we see green, yellow snot, both with mm -hmm. virus infections and bacterial infections. Right. So that in and of itself doesn't prove that this is caused by a bacteria or something like that. You can have that with a viral infection. Um, and so that is kind of one of the common misconceptions that, that we hear. The other thing that as an infectious disease specialist I hear um, pretty often is uh, concerns about the height of a fever and whether mm -hmm. a high fever means that this is a bacterial infection or not. And again, I we see lots of kids with infections mm -hmm. and I've seen kids who have had serious bacterial infections who maybe haven't had a very high fever mm -hmm. and kids with viral infections that have had very high, very fevers. high fevers. And yeah. so um, that also is not kind of definitive for it being one or the other. Are there any type of bacterial infections that you don't need to treat with antibiotics that may get better on their own? Yeah, so that's a, a great question um, because as we'll talk about, um, over-treatment of some of these things leads to your increasing your risk for mm -hmm. having a resistant infection. Um, two of the most common ones I think that uh, kids run into that um, in some cases it's appropriate to not treat with an antibiotic mm -hmm. even though they're caused by bacteria um, are bacterial sinusitis or sinus infections mm -hmm. and um, bacterial ear infections. We know that um, especially for both of those two most kids will get better um, mm -hmm. on their own. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that if they're having things like ear pain you can give them um, things to help with the pain like ibuprofen or um, acetaminophen um, and kind of symptomatic relief and they will tend to get better on their own. But those are probably the two most common ones mm -hmm. that we, we run into that it is appropriate in some cases to watch and see if the child improves. Absolutely. One of the ones we see a lot in that my pediatrics office is conjunctivitis. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to change our, our kind of management of that too and not using the antibiotics, um, antibiotic drops or ointments as quickly as we used to. Right, yeah. Because most kids will get better on their own. Exactly. Um, and sometimes it just shortens the treatment by a day or two. Exactly. No, mm -hmm. that's a Or a shortens the point. symptoms, excuse me, not treatment. Yeah. Um, Any time that we can avoid exposing kids to things that might increase their risk of having a, a side effect mm -hmm. or um, a reaction to, I think we always prefer to do that. Okay, so well, let's talk a little bit about side effects now that you're bringing that up. Mm -hmm. What are some of the side effects of antibiotics? Because people really seem to want them sometimes because they want to feel better, right? Right. Um, but with anything, there's risks and there's unintended consequences sometimes. Exactly. So like all medications, as you mentioned, there are um, risks and benefits. And so mm -hmm. it's always important to have that discussion with your healthcare provider if they're planning to uh, prescribe an antibiotic and to find out if one's going to help you or not. Mm -hmm. um, some of the most common um, side effects that we hear about with antibiotics, the most common one I would say probably is diarrhea. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, so antibiotics will kill uh, harmful bacteria that are causing your infection, but they also have a big impact on uh, the helpful bacteria that live in and on our body as well. And so diarrhea is probably one of the most common things um, that we hear about. Um, antibiotics can cause allergic reactions ranging from relatively mild to very severe mm -hmm. allergic reactions or anaphylaxis um, that can be life-threatening. So we do see um, cases of that. Um, they can also cause other types of allergic reactions mm -hmm. that cause kind of serious um, skin uh, rashes um, that can be quite serious and end up uh, having to admit kids to hospital for that. Um, uh, like all medications, antibiotics need to be processed by our body. Usually that's mm -hmm. done through our liver and our kidney. Mm -hmm. um, and so, especially if you're on them for a long period of time, it can lead to harm to those organs as well. Okay. Well, we've mentioned antibiotic resistance. Let's get to that topic mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, why does inappropriately prescribing antibiotics lead to the resistance um, development that we're seeing? Yeah, so we know that um, overprescribing of antibiotics really is the biggest driver of mm -hmm. uh, the problems with antibiotic resistance that we're seeing. Um, it is a complicated process and there's a lot of different factors involved that that truly is the thing that's really speeding up um, our path towards uh, having these resistant uh, bacteria. Um, 
I think we have a graphic that uh, will maybe help to explain this a bit more. So as I mentioned, um, we have as many bacterial cells that live in and on our bodies as human cells. Um, some of these are helpful and some of these can be harmful. Amongst these uh, bacteria, there are some that are relatively more resistant to antibiotics and some that are more sensitive. So when you give someone an antibiotic, um, you kill off the more sensitive ones and then the more resistant bacteria are uh, kind of left over. And those are the ones that then go on to divide and uh, repopulate uh, the person's uh, flora. And so that when you imagine that process kind of happening in a person over time and amongst lots of different people in the population, you kind of uh, tend to move towards having more drug resistant uh, bacteria. And then bacteria are also able to kind of trade their genes. Um, and so they can then pass on their resistance genes to other bacteria that are living in the same place. And so that is kind of how we see um, resistance developing and why this has been a problem that's happened kind of over time. Other than overprescribing of antibiotics um, inappropriately for infections, so a third of the time, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, are there other factors that are in place that are maybe driving this resistance that we're seeing worldwide? Yeah, so there are a lot of different um, things that are contributing. Um, one of the big areas is the use of antibiotics in agriculture and in uh, animals and that mm -hmm. ending up ultimately in our food supply. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the number of tons of antibiotics that are prescribed in the United States, mm -hmm. actually about 70 to 75 percent of that is prescribed to animals and not oh even gosh. in humans. So it's huge wow. and there's a lot of work kind of being done in that mm -hmm. area to see how we can um, safely reduce that without compromising the safety of our food supply. Um, so that's a huge contributor. Um, there is a uh, some contribution uh, also uh, from people not uh, taking antibiotics as prescribed. So if you take them for um, uh, too long or too short, that can lead to problems. Sharing antibiotics with family members or things like that also mm -hmm. leads to problems. Um, and so there's kind of a lot of different facets to this this issue. Okay. We have a great audience question that just touched on, on that. Is is it always advised to complete the full antibiotic course? Or are we starting, or are we starting to really look at how long do we need to treat things? Are we over treating or under treating them? Yeah, so um, that's a great question because it's uh, an area that is uh, being actively researched okay. now, and people are um, very interested in looking at. Um, traditionally, we've had kind of fixed lengths of treatment that we would prescribe to patients, mm -hmm. usually kind of 7, 10, or 14 days for most infections. Um, but people are looking to see whether we may be able to get away with shorter uh, durations of treatment for some of the common infections. And so there are studies underway right now that are looking um, at that question. Um, while we're waiting for kind of more science mm -hmm. to back us up on those things, I think it's important for patients to have an open discussion with their uh, doctor mm -hmm. or whoever has prescribed the antibiotics. I don't think um, they should necessarily just stop their antibiotics when they're feeling better because right. we know that for uh, some infections that's not uh, mm -hmm. safe and there's a chance the infection could come back if you stop too early. Um, but certainly it can be kind of an open discussion with your uh, healthcare provider to decide whether mm -hmm. um, you need to take X length of treatment. Okay. As a, as a provider, we always um, think about what are we trying to treat? Um, what antibiotic is going to be the most specific for that one? Because there's there's something called you know broad spectrum antibiotics. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that might relate to the resistance that we're seeing? Yeah, so um, we can kind of classify different antibiotics based on how many different types of bacteria or families of bacteria they can kill or they work against. Um, and so when we talk about broad spectrum antibiotics, we're talking about antibiotics that uh, work against a wide variety mm -hmm. of different uh, types of bacteria. Whereas when we talk about um, narrow spectrum antibiotics, those are pretty focused mm -hmm. and targeted to kill um, certain bacteria. Um, we know that uh, exposure to broad spectrum antibiotics, especially for prolonged periods of time, uh, increases your risk of having a more resistant infection the next time you were to get an infection. And also seems to push this uh, process of resistance that we described with mm -hmm. the graphic along kind of faster than the narrow spectrum antibiotics. And so it is uh, really important if someone is very sick and comes into hospital, usually uh, to be safe, we will prescribe a broad spectrum antibiotic because you don't want to miss something mm -hmm. in that circumstance. Um, but once you get more information back from the lab about exactly what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. oftentimes we're able to kind of narrow um, and change the antibiotic to something more, more targeted. Absolutely. So parents might get a phone call saying we need to switch your antibiotic. And that's, that's actually a good thing. That means we're really trying to target 
that specific bug. Exactly. Okay. So the most common scenario yeah. that I think that yeah. comes up in is if you have a child with yeah. a urinary tract infection right. and they're started on antibiotic before we have the um, name of the bacteria mm-hmm. um, back, then sometimes we're able to change it to something more narrow spectrum once we have that It doesn't mean that we don't know what we're doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it means we're actually trying to do the best treatment, less side effects for your child, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And it takes some time. We have excellent... Uh, labs that kind of help us to care for these patients Mm -hmm. and it takes a bit of time for them to take the sample and grow the bacteria and tell us which antibiotics work best and so it's very appropriate once we have that information to to change and target our treatment awesome well i hear a lot in the news um about superbugs and it sounds Mm -hmm. really scary Mm -hmm. um and we're seeing it all over the world what are superbugs um and uh should we be frightened sure so uh superbugs is kind of a term that we use to refer to different types of uh, resistant bacteria, typically bacteria that are resistant to more than one family of antibiotics. Um, and so people may be familiar, it's a bit of an alphabet soup kind of thing, mm-hmm. but um, people may be familiar with MRSA or MRSA or uh, VRE, vancomycin resistant uh, enterococcus. Uh, there's lots of other ones, ESBLs, uh, CREs, but these are- <laughs> It is alphabet soup. Yeah, <laughs> they're, all, they're all acronyms. Yeah. Um, but these are kind of uh, concerning bugs that have developed resistance to um, most of our uh, first line or usual mm-hmm. treatments. Um, and so they're things that as infectious disease specialists, we keep a close eye on and are always kind of concerned when we see patients with infections with these um, for multiple reasons. Um, including the fact that uh, they can be more difficult to treat. We Mm -hmm. usually have fewer options to treat them. Um, They make people um, quite sick, and sometimes we need to use um, older or sometimes more um, toxic antibiotics just because those are the only options that we we have to treat some of them. So, yeah. How, um, how, as an infectious disease community, are you trying to keep some of those those antibiotics that um, are kind of a last resort, keeping them so they still work and don't develop those multi- drug-resistant organisms or the superbugs? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that um, we've been trying to do to help kind of slow down this progress uh, that we're seeing uh, towards resistance. Um, As infectious disease specialists, one of the big things is antimicrobial stewardship or kind of lending some level of protection uh, to antibiotics because they're quite unique in when it comes to all the different things that Mm -hmm. we prescribe and that they have uh, an impact on public health. So prescribing an antibiotic to you or um, your neighbor affects how um, effective they might be for you in the future. Mm -hmm. And so um, in a hospital setting, we do have certain antibiotics that are uh, somewhat restricted. So if someone wants to prescribe them, um, they will need to call uh, their infectious disease service and we'll kind of discuss Mm -hmm. and decide whether it's a good choice for that patient or not. Um, So that's kind of one of the things. And then we're also involved in kind of reviewing the kids in hospital who are on antibiotics and helping um, doctors from different teams decide whether they're on the best treatment or whether there's something we can change to help protect them from uh, developing resistance. Okay. The microbiome is kind of another Mm -hmm. another hot topic, both in like literature, research, and and also in in the news. What is the microbiome and um, and how does that relate to the good bacteria? Sure. So, yeah, yeah it's important to realize that um, not all bacteria are bad. Mm-hmm. In fact, most of the bacteria that we have um, in and on our bodies help to protect us and help to keep us healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the microbiome uh, kind of refers to that population of bacteria and microorganisms that uh, live in and on us um, and that are generally uh, beneficial to us. Um, It's a complicated kind of rainforest of different um, organisms um, that is very individual. So we think probably Mm -hmm. even as individual as your fingerprint um, and can be affected by a lot of things, Mm -hmm. um, including uh, your gender, where you live, um, whether you've taken antibiotics recently, whether you have other chronic illnesses or uh, Mm -hmm. diseases. Um, It's an area of very active research. Mm -hmm. Even here at Mayo, there are people that are working on it uh, because we're still trying to kind of understand First, how do we measure it the best? Mm-hmm. Um, and secondly, kind of what impact does it have on our health? And are there things that we can do to um, help to preserve it or to kind of um, harness it to keep, keep each other healthy? Okay, on the topic of microbiome, we have mm-hmm. a great question about probiotics because um, probiotics are thought of to be kind of the good bacteria. True. Um, and they, this person is wondering if, if there is a benefit to using probiotics if you're prescribing an antibiotic. Sure, so that's a great question. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's kind of a area of uh, active research within infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. Um, If you think about probiotics, most probiotics are uh, kind of one or a few types of um, helpful bacteria in kind of a very concentrated form. 
as I mentioned with the microbiome, it's like a rainforest of different bacteria. Mm -hmm. So um, when you give someone an antibiotic, you may decrease the variety within their microbiome. Um, probiotics can help to reintroduce some good bacteria, but it's almost like cutting down the trees in a rainforest and then replanting all of the same type of tree. Mm -hmm. It's not really exactly the same thing that you've done. Okay. Um, it may be helpful in some situations in kids. Um, we think that likely uh, if they're prescribed an antibiotic, getting a probiotic can help to reduce their chances of getting diarrhea mm -hmm. from the antibiotic. So there's pretty good um, research to support that, but um, we're still kind of trying to figure mm -hmm. out um, where they may be more helpful. Okay. Um, in does the timing of when they take the probiotic matter, does it need to be after they complete the antibiotic course or during it? Um, so generally, it uh, doesn't really matter. It probably depends a bit on what antibiotic mm -hmm. you're taking and what probiotic. Um, but for prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, generally we ask that tell them to take it while they're on the antibiotic. Okay. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's talk about a little bit, uh, a little, a little bit about some of um, the classification of allergies to antibiotics mm. and how that might relate to antibiotic resistance? Yeah, so this is a great question that we get a lot of uh, questions from our patients about as well. Mm -hmm. um, antibiotic allergies are um, very important, mm -hmm. um, but there are kind of a lot of misconceptions out there about what an antibiotic allergy is, and that leads to a lot of people being labeled as having an antibiotic mm -hmm. allergy when they really probably are not. So mm -hmm. when they've looked at penicillin allergies, um, probably about 90% of people who report a penicillin allergy aren't actually allergic. Mm -hmm. The reason this is important is um, that when you do have an infection and you go to a doctor and you have a listed uh, penicillin allergy, um, the number of options your physician has to choose from to treat you becomes much more limited mm -hmm. because penicillins are a big family of antibiotics and usually the first choice treatment for a lot of different common infections. Um, and so we have much uh, fewer options to choose from. And those options tend to be more broad spectrum options. We talked a bit about um, why that's a problem with resistance. They can be more toxic or have more side effects and they tend to be more expensive as well. Mm -hmm. So for all those reasons, um, it's important to not have people labeled with an allergy unless they truly are mm -hmm. um, allergic. Um, so common uh, side effects from antibiotics, things mm -hmm. like diarrhea are not um, an allergy. Or um, vomiting and nausea. Exactly, mm -hmm. abdominal pain, um, vomiting, mm -hmm. nausea are common things, unfortunately, that people on antibiotics get mm -hmm. and uh, certainly aren't pleasant, but um, shouldn't be documented as an allergy um, to that. And those are antibiotic. more side effects, not actual allergies. Exactly. Yeah. So when we talk about allergy, really what mm -hmm. we're talking about is um, uh, hives type rash. Mm -hmm. um, so these are usually very itchy, um, red, raised um, rashes that can kind of seem to move around in different places. Um, and then certainly some of the more serious uh, symptoms of a allergy uh, can be uh, swelling of the airway, difficulty breathing, low blood pressure. Um, those are all obviously kind of serious um, manifestations of allergy. Um, but non-hives rashes uh, are quite common um, and are generally not a sign of an allergic reaction. And that's kind of that and diarrhea are kind of the two main things that we see people mm -hmm. being uh, told that they're allergic to an antibiotic when really they, they aren't. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I see that a lot in my practice too, so it's helpful to talk mm -hmm. to your provider and talk to potentially an allergist to help with clearing up that, that concerns about allerg the allergy too, exactly. especially penicillin classes. Exactly. Yeah. So there is um, uh, skin testing that allergists can do if they uh, think from the story that you would mm -hmm. be a good candidate mm -hmm. um, to have that done. Um, and so definitely an important thing to talk to your physician about to see if maybe um, that applies to you or your child. Okay. We have another excellent audience question. And so this one says, so many viral infections um, pro progress to become a bacterial secondary infection, is what this person is saying. And why, why shouldn't we just start the antibiotic treatment as soon as the symptoms appear? Yeah, so it is true that having a viral infection can increase your risk of developing what we call a bacterial superinfection. Mm -hmm. um, at the time of the viral symptoms, it is basically impossible to predict which people will go on mm -hmm. to develop a bacterial infection mm -hmm. and which people will just recover and do well on their own. Right. And we know that starting an antibiotic during the time of that viral infection mm -hmm. um, doesn't prevent uh, or affect which path you kind of go down and certainly does have side effects um, associated with it, which can be serious. 
Um, and so it's kind of important to know what signs to look out mm-hmm. for in your child when they have a viral right. illness that can kind of um, trigger you to think maybe they've developed a bacterial um, infection post and that they should be seen by a physician. So one of the common things that we see in that scenario is a child who has a virus, maybe cough, cold, runny nose, who seems like they're getting better mm-hmm. and then again develop kind of high fever, they're more tired. Um, more lethargic and feeling worse, Mm -hmm. um, that can be kind of your first um, sign that maybe they've developed a super infection. And so you would want to take them in to to see your uh, primary care provider or physician. Absolutely. Those bacterial super infections are actually really quite uncommon. We think about the majority of kids who have viruses, upper respiratory tract infections. I see very, very few in my office that actually have a secondary infection. Yes, that's a very important point. Mm -hmm. most kids with virus infections, their body fights it mm-hmm. off, they go on to recover. So it is a small proportion of them that will develop a complication like that. Um, and so certainly we don't want to be treating all of these kids with viruses with antibiotics because the risk of doing that is much, much greater. Yeah, absolutely. Another another great myth dispelled about antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk um, a little bit about the trends you're seeing in antibiotic resistance in children because that's something that you guys are actively monitoring in the hospital setting. Yeah, so um, we have a great lab here that kind of keeps track of this um, for us and every year they kind of release to us the um, susceptibility or sensitivity patterns that we're seeing in mm-hmm. some of the common bacteria that we uh, treat in kids uh, in the hospital here. And most hospitals around the country will have mm-hmm. something similar to that. Um, we are definitely seeing more antibiotic resistant infections in children. Um, when I'm in the hospital, uh, I get lots of calls from people in the community mm-hmm. even um, who have results that show that they have a child that has an infection with a drug resistant organism. In the past, it used to be really just kids who unfortunately have had to spend a lot of time in hospital or who have lots of other uh, medical conditions that they have to take antibiotics frequently for. But uh, more recently, we seem to be getting more calls even from otherwise healthy kids who haven't really um, been exposed to, to much or have not had a lot of previous infections that end up growing a bacteria that's quite resistant. And so we are uh, definitely getting more and more and seeing more and more of those, those cases now. Um, So we do know kind of uh, infections with some of the superbugs that we're talking about are on the rise, um, especially amongst um, urinary tract infections, which we see um, not uh, too uncommonly in kids. Um, We're definitely noticing um, that those are becoming more difficult to treat. In some cases, to the point where um, there aren't antibiotics by mouth that we can Mm -hmm. use to treat some of these, and then we're having to admit kids to get uh, IV antibiotics and things like that. Okay. But there's lots we can do, like you've talked about, to try and, 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 and make the resistance patterns slow down that we're seeing and so we can preserve the antibiotics that we have. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a lot of different things that we can do. Yeah. The first thing and the best thing is just to prevent getting infections in mm-hmm. the first place. Um, so as simple as it sounds, um, in infectious diseases, we like to harp on mm-hmm. hand washing. Yes. Um, and so uh, that is probably the most effective way to keep you and your family mm-hmm. healthy. Um, keeping your vaccines up to date. We have a lot of uh, vaccinations that can uh, prevent uh, thing, common infections like uh, ear infections and sinus infections and things like that. And so making sure that um, your family has all of their vaccines up to date is uh, very important. Um, and then if you do end up needing to take an antibiotic, making sure that you uh, take it as prescribed, um, that you don't uh, stop it early, um, and that uh, you let your physician know if you're having any problems or side effects from it. Um, is an important part of it as well. Absolutely. This has been wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of your knowledge about antibiotics and resistance and how we can try and stem this um, from worsening. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, Join us for the next Ask the Mayo Mom, which will be on April 5th. Our guests will be Dr. Flora Howie, who is a developmental and behavioral pediatrician. April is National Autism Awareness Month, and autism will be the focus of our discussion with Dr. Howie, who is an expert in autism. Um, Thank you everyone who joined us and sent in questions today. If we weren't able to get to those during the live broadcast, we will try our best uh, after the show. Um, Please um, have a wonderful day and join us next time.